Okay, so uh, let's start. Uh, welcome everybody to the algorithmic uh, game theory, Israel algorithmic game theory seminar. Today we have uh, Shang Wu Li talking about investment incentives in near optimal mechanisms. So welcome. Uh, cool. Thank you so much for having me. It's 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 an honor to be here. It's it's really great to get feedback from you all. Uh, this is a uh, so this is a paper of really four economists trying our best to take computation seriously. Uh, almost certainly there'll be things that, you know, we don't know that we should know. Um, and it'd be really good to, you know, get your sense about what the interesting questions are and, you know, sort of what angles to think about this project from. So um, this is joint work with uh, Mohammed, Scott and Paul. Um, and really we're thinking about scenarios like this. We're thinking about situations where we're allocating some sort of integer resource and we've available to us uh, you know, transfers, transferable utility in the usual sense. So think about this like we're, you know, um, we're auctioning slots on an airline runway, right? We are deciding who gets to land their plane. We're deciding in a spectrum auction which television stations get to remain broadcasting on the air. And so, you know, there's a, it, it's natural to ask how, how should we decide who gets which resources and how much they pay? And there's of course a standard classical answer, which is that you could use a Vickery Clark Groves mechanism. Uh, and this is several advantages. The first is that it's strategy proof. So it's a, uh, it's, it's a dominant strategy to report your value for the resources truthfully to the mechanism. Uh, another advantage is that it has efficient allocations. And of course, you know, this is almost definitionally true, right? The, VCG mechanism takes in the reports of all the values and then chooses whatever allocation of resources maximizes welfare. Now there's a third uh, property of the VCG mechanisms, which is less well known, uh, but it turns out just equally fundamental. It has uh, efficient investment incentives in the following sense. So imagine I fix a profile of values for the bidders. And what I do is I, I alter just one bidder's value holding everybody else fixed. Now, in a VCG mechanism, what happens is that the change in that bidder's payoff under the mechanism is exactly equal to the change in social welfare from the algorithm, right? From the mechanism's chosen allocation. And so what that means is that the bidder is going to gain by investing. Uh, that's to say he would pay a cost to change his value even only if net social welfare increases. So in that sense, VCG mechanisms have this nice property that the prices they present exactly align private and social investment incentives. Uh, now, there are several caveats to that analysis I just offered you. Um, and uh, the first caveat is that this is implicitly a complete information story, right? It assumes that the bidder knows their threshold price in the VCG mechanism and, and makes the decision with that information. And so, of course, if you were bidding in a second price auction uh, and you were uncertain about, you know, your threshold price, it could be that you make investments that are profitable in expectation, but ex post are socially suboptimal. Um, so this, you know, this story requires the bidder to have some notion of what threshold price they're going to face. Uh, another issue is that uh, if there are multiple bidders making simultaneous investments, uh, coordination issues can arise. So you can come up with examples where my investment and your investment are strategic complements. Um, and so there can be both good equilibria and bad equilibria under the VCG mechanism. Uh, but the argument I've just offered you is sufficient to establish there exists at least one good equilibria of the mechanism, uh, one mechanism, one equilibrium where it all works out well. But I'm gonna sort of mostly abstract from these two concerns in this talk, though they are real concerns, uh, because I wanna focus more on the third caveat, which is that VCG mechanisms rely on exact optimization. And I mean exact optimization by the auctioneer, by the person running the mechanism. The VCG mechanism relies on us being able to compute uh, the welfare maximizing resource allocation. And that can be a problem because of course, you know, there can exist real world settings where exact optimization is infeasible, right? So. Uh, think about spectrum auctions with local interference constraints, right? So you may have seen this uh, little graphic before, right? That thing on the right uh, is, those are the interference constraints for the FCC's 2017 reverse auction. 
in which they were trying to figure out which TV stations should remain on the air. Uh, each node in that graph is a television station. Each edge in that graph uh, represents the fact that these two stations cannot be assigned to the same channel without causing interference with each other. And so the legal mandate for the spectrum auction was however many channels we're using, however many channels are available for television, we need to assign channels to TV stations in a way that no two stations that remain on the air interfere with each other, which of course is just the graph color problem, right? We're coloring the nodes in this graph so that no two adjacent nodes share a color. Uh, you know, checking feasibility is NP hard. Um, you know, this audience is probably well aware, combinatorial auctions, right? With even sort of moderately generous ideas about what value functions bidders could have, calculating the optimal assignment of bundles to bidders is NP hard. Similarly, electricity auctions, right? Where all the time buying and selling electricity at auction, um, you know, we, uh, you know, every day, every minute in some countries, we are deciding, you know, which power stations are generating how much power and how much they're being paid to do that. Uh, that involves a number of NP hard problems. There's the unit commitment problem. There's the optimal power flow problem. Uh, but all the time, these things happen in the background. Now, of course, in practice, that doesn't mean that the fact that we can't compute exact optima in situations like these doesn't prevent us from running mechanisms. What we often do is we use heuristic allocation rules, right? So we use heuristic allocation rules that seem like a good idea and can be computed reasonably quickly. So our research question here is, you know, imagine we take these heuristic allocation rules and we sort of, we, we implement them with a strategy proof mechanism. Uh, what happens to, in to incentives to invest? We know that if we've got VCG, right, if we can compute exact optima, the investment incentives are in a sense good. Um, is that true if you only have approximate optima? And so uh, informally, here's where the results are going. Uh, a natural question is if you have an inefficient allocation rule in a strategy proof mechanism, does that lead to inefficient investments? And it turns out that the answer is yes. Uh, inefficient allocation rules have these kind of algorithmic externalities. It turns out that the, the fact that the algorithm isn't exactly optimizing creates spillovers that leads to inefficient investments. And I'll show you an example shortly. Um, a natural next question is, okay, maybe asking for exactly efficient investments, getting the in investment incentives exactly right is just too demanding. So is it true that if I had a nearly efficient allocation rule, uh, and it's strategy proof, then I can get nearly efficient investments. And it turns out, unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, arbitrarily good allocation rules can have arbitrarily bad investment incentives. Um, but nonetheless, the main positive result of the paper is to provide a simple sufficient condition under which this implication goes through. So uh, it turns out that if the algorithm uh, the allocation rule excludes bossy negative externalities, a condition we call axbone, then the investment incentives are going to be okay. Uh, that's to say, if you were nearly efficient as an allocation rule, you're going to remain nearly efficient when we add investment incentives. Um, and then we deliver a characterization result. We show that a certain condition, which we call weak axbone, is necessary and sufficient for the, uh, for the implication to go through. So at, at a very high level, that's what we're doing. We're thinking about how these investment incentives work. Uh, we're showing that, that, that there can be various problems that crop up depending on how you ask the question. We're showing a sort of simple condition on allocation algorithms that gets things to work okay. Um, and so I'm gonna use as a running example in this talk, the knapsack problem. Um, and so, you know, as this audience probably knows, uh, the way this works, of course, is that an instance of the problem just specifies a set of bidders and each bidder has a value and a size, and it also specifies a capacity for the knapsack. Uh, and our problem, of course, is to just choose uh, an allocation, that's to say a subset of the bidders to maximize the sum of the values of the packed bidders subject to the sum of their sizes not exceeding the capacity constraint. So you can think of this like we're packing integer cargo on a ship, right? And bidders have different value for their cargo getting on the ship. Now, of course, this is an NP hard problem, uh, you know, as, Again, like, sorry about this. Some of these slides are designed for economists for whom these facts are not common knowledge. Um, so, you know, think about this instance, right? Uh, there are two little bidders. Each of them has a value of 10 and a size of 10. And there's a big bidder who has a value of six and a size of 12. And there's a knapsack of capacity 20. 
Now, since we aren't going to exactly optimize, what we're going to do instead is to use a Danzig's greedy algorithm, right? So what this does is first we sort the values by uh, bang for the buck, right? Value per unit size in descending order. So the little bidders have a value over size of one. So they come first in line. The big bidder has a value over size of a half. So he goes last in line. Uh, then we pack bidders from left to right. And we stop when the next bidder doesn't fit, right? Now this is, you know, not, not optimal, but it might be a reasonable heuristic for the problem. Uh, and, you know, of course, it's natural to say what happens if the values are private information. And of course, we can still run the greedy algorithm when values are private. So if the sizes were observable, if that were a physical fact about the cargo we, we were packing, but each bidder knew for themselves what their value for getting the cargo on the ship was, well, then we could just ask the bidders to report their values. We could run the greedy algorithm on the reported values. And then we could charge each packed bidder their threshold price, right? We charge each packed bidder the least amount they could report, the least value they could have, such that they would be packed by the algorithm. Right? Hey, so the, can I, can yeah. I ask a question? Are you yeah. referring to private value but public size? Yes, yes. I'm thinking private value but public size. Um, so yeah, that, that, thanks for reminding me. That is, that, that is important. Um, so you know, if I'm just trying to elicit the values here, right, in order to do that, I can run this threshold mechanism, right, which is going to be strategy proof in the same way that second price auctions are strategy proof. So, you know, the big bit, so, so for the little bidders, in order to get packed by the greedy algorithm, they need a value over size of at least a half, right, they need to come ahead of the big bidder. So they need a value of at least five, so their threshold price is five. The big bidder, in order to get packed, has to get first in line. And to get first in line, he needs a value of one, so a value over size of one. So he needs a value of at least 12. And so his threshold price is 12. Um, now, of course, uh, now, now what I wanna do is to take this simple example, right? And augment it by adding an investment opportunity. So we're gonna imagine that the big bidder gets a chance, you know, the big bidder knows his threshold price and is going to make a choice to, in, you know, to possibly pay a cost to increase his value. And so imagine right now that the big bidder who's not packed and has zero utility could in fact just choose to invest, raise his value to 14 at a cost of one. Now, what's this gonna do? If he makes this investment, then he gets first in line, right? Because his value over size exceeds one. Um, he's gonna get packed by the greedy algorithm which will pack him and then terminate. So, uh, this is going to be profitable because he has a value of 14, he pays a price of 12, he pays a cost of one. And so it's, it's privately profitable to make this investment. Uh, but this investment is bad for welfare, right? We started with a welfare of 20 by packing both small bidders. And now welfare is, well, 13 because we've packed just a big bidder. And on top of that, we've wasted a dollar of investment cost, which, you know, a, so, you know, a sort of benevolent social planner wouldn't do. Um, so what this shows you is that if you take a heuristic algorithm and you build it into a strategy proof mechanism, uh, private invest, privately profitable investments are no longer aligned with social welfare in the same way that greedy algorithm, sorry, in the same way that VCG mechanisms would. Um, now I want to take this example and lift it to a little bit more generality. Uh, so this is the primitive of the model. The, the sort of basic primitive is an allocation instance which specifies for some sort of bidders uh, a, a value profile. So think of this as a value for being packed um, and a set of feasible allocations, uh, which is a subset of the power set of the bidders. So we're sort of agnostic as to the structure of these feasible allocations. Uh, they could be all the sets of bidders whose sizes sum to less than 10. They could be all the sets of TV stations that can broadcast simultaneously without interference. Uh, it's, it doesn't really matter for the results exactly what structure that set A has. Um, because we're mostly thinking about eliciting the values V and having the algorithm run on the elicited values given the constraints A. Uh, you can generalize these to multidimensional types and the paper does that, but in fact, most of the core insights you can see with the single dimensional case. Uh, so I'm gonna focus on the single dimensional case. So an allocation problem omega is just going to be a collection of allocation instances. Um, it's, you know, like the knapsack problem is the collection of all the knapsack instances. And I'm going to make a substantive assumption. I'm going to assume that for all uh, A, for all sets of feasible allocations we might pay, face, 
the potential values of the bidders are a product of closed intervals. So each bid, for each bidder, there's a closed interval and their value could be anything in that closed interval. Um, the reason I'm making this assumption is because I want to use the envelope theorem. It makes it a lot neater if I can use the envelope theorem. Um, an allocation rule, which I'm gonna abuse language and call an algorithm, uh, chooses a feasible allocation. So for each instance, it takes an instance as an argument uh, and outputs one of the feasible allocations. And I'm gonna use Xn as an indicator equal to one if bidder n is packed. Um, a payment rule just specifies a payment for each bidder. So it takes as an argument the instance and gives me a profile of payments. And a mechanism is just a pair consisting of an algorithm and a payment rule. Cool? So, so far so good. This is probably very familiar, uh, but you know, in case I've been sort of ambiguous or sloppy, please just you know, feel free to clarify, feel free to like ask me to get more precise. So, you know, uh, given some algorithm, we'd like to convert it into a strategy proof mechanism. Uh, that's the usual definition of strategy proof up there, right? That says that, you know, for every bidder, for every instance and for every bidder, reporting their value is the best response. Um, and, uh, you know, we're gonna say that an algorithm is monotone if every bidder n, there exists a packing threshold such that if his value is strictly above that threshold, he's packed. And if it's strictly below that threshold, he's not packed. Uh, and so if a, you have a monotone algorithm, you can do that same trick you saw earlier, right? You just charge each pack bidder a price equal to a threshold, um, right? And that's how you would generate a strategy proof mechanism for that algorithm. Uh, and as you may know, uh, the monotone algorithms are the only algorithms we can convert into strategy proof mechanisms. So this uh, result by Lehman, O'Callaghan and Shea says that there exists a payment rule P such that the algorithm compared with that payment rule is strategy proof, even only if the algorithm is monotone. So these are the relevant universe of algorithms we can turn into mechanisms. Uh, so we're gonna restrict attention to these monotone algorithms. Now, uh, we can simplify the problem even further. It turns out that the strategy proof payment rule we need to deal with is essentially unique. So if the algorithm and its associated payment rule, the mechanism is strategy proof, then there exists functions, one for each bidder that don't depend on that bidder's value, such that uh, the payment that bidder makes is equal to an indicator for whether they are packed, multiplied by their threshold price, their packing threshold under the algorithm, plus a function that doesn't depend on their own value. Now, of course, if that function doesn't depend on your value, then your choice of investments doesn't, doesn't affect anything about that function. So a corollary of this observation, right? This observation is really the envelope theorem. Uh, a corollary of this observation is that any two strategy proof mechanisms for the same algorithm yield the same investment choices. And so that's kind of neat, right? That says that the investment incentives in a strategy proof mechanism are entirely pinned down by our choice of allocation algorithm. And if we were to pick the exactly optimal allocation rule, then it would get these things exactly right. And we're just interested in the question when you plug in a different monotone allocation algorithm, what happens? Okay, so here are some desiderata that we might want. So I'm gonna use this uh, W of X to denote the welfare the algorithm delivers at this instance. So it's just the sum of the values of the packed bidders. Uh, and one thing we might want is to have efficient allocations. That'd be great if we could have it, right? So that says for every instance, the welfare that you get is equal to the maximum you could get maximizing overall the feasible allocations. Uh, another thing we might want is to have efficient investments, which is to say that suppose bidder N, knowing the other bidder's value, so he knows the prices he's gonna face, can invest to change his value. We'd like him to profit from that investment even only if the welfare gain exceeds the cost. So one way of thinking about this is this is a bit like, you know, we're in some long run steady state of a mechanism, right? We've been running this mechanism, you know, day after day, uh, you know, we're running say an electricity auction, although really electricity auctions aren't quite strategy proof, but imagine for a moment they were, right? You know each day, you know, today is a sunny, you know, it's a sunny November afternoon. We're figuring out what the electricity price will be. It turns out that in these auctions you're making investment decisions every morning. You're deciding 
you know, which units to commit. You're deciding how much to ramp up your power plant, which affects your marginal cost of provision and so on. Um, and you're making that decision with some reasonable forecasts of your prices that you'll face this afternoon. Um, and this sort of adjustment, we'd like it to be that you will make a given adjustment, even only if that the welfare gain of that adjustment exceeds the cost. And that's just that, you know, that requirement in math that says, give me any instance uh, VA, any change in bidder N's value, V tilde N, and any cost, uh, we'd like it to be that uh, bidder N's utility under the mechanism rises from that investment, even only if the welfare delivered net of the investment cost is above the original welfare. Cool. And we're, you know, this requires this for any change and for any cost. Cool. Now, um, you know, it turns out this is an, an, a known result that VCG mechanisms do all these things well, right? So Rogerson 92 uh, shows that the VCG mechanism gets this efficient investment thing. So the VCG mechanism has efficient allocations, it's strategy proof, it has efficient investments. And the key intuition is that the VCG mechanism internalizes all the externalities. Each bidder's threshold price exactly equals the welfare loss to others when he is packed. So when he's making an investment decision, he's taking already into account the effect of any change in his value on the other bidders. And so any privately profitable investment decision is a socially optimal investment decision. So, you know, that example we had earlier, right? That example shows this is not gonna be true generally for a heuristic algorithm. So in a heuristic algorithm, the threshold prices may not reflect the full social costs. They may not reflect the welfare losses to other bidders. So, you know, you remember this greedy example, right? The big bidder's threshold price is a 12, but the cost of packing him is not 12. The cost of packing him under the algorithm is 20. When we pack him, we lose both little bidders. Uh, and so the, the misalignment is an externality, right? It's an unpriced effect. The difference between 12 and 20 is an unpriced effect on the welfare of the other bidders. And so it's natural to ask, which are the allocation algorithms such that their threshold prices, which we would need the threshold prices that would make them strategy proof, which allocation algorithms have the property that their threshold prices would internalize all the externalities and thereby lead to efficient investments. Um, and so let me give you that, that answer. Let me give you the largest class of, al class of algorithms with this nice property. Uh, so this is a weakening of efficient allocations, which we call range efficient allocations. Uh, efficient allocations is just up there, the same as before. Range efficient allocations, the only differences are in red. So range efficient allocations says you give me any A, any set of feasible allocations, there exists a subset R such that for every value profile V, the welfare that the algorithm achieves is the same as we get from maximizing over this subset. Now it's, it's worth noting the order of quantifiers, right? Uh, R depends on A, but it doesn't depend on V, right? So that says, you know, you've got to be able to make this restriction before looking at the value profile. Uh, and so that does place, this is not a vacuous condition. Uh, if for some generic value profile, that's to say some value profile where no two allocations are exactly tied for welfare, the algorithm outputs some allocation A star, we can infer that A star is in this set R. And so we therefore know that if the algorithm has range efficient allocations, that no matter how we change the value profile for any other value profile V prime, the algorithm must do no worse than it would by uh, outputting a star. So this is, um, for instance, for the knapsack problem, the greedy algorithm does not satisfy range efficiency. Uh, there can be cases where value profiles where it outputs some uh, packing, and then I change the values and it outputs a packing that would do, it would do strictly worse than it would by staying still. Cool. So this is a lot like, you know, this class of maximal in range uh, allocations. This is slightly weaker than that because we're not requiring you choose the allocation from the range that's maximizing. We're allowing in the case of ties that you might choose another allocation that's exactly tied with it, but that's not a really important distinction. Cool, okay, so I've given you uh, a weakening of efficient allocations, the range efficient allocations. It turns out only these algorithms 
manage to completely avoid algorithmic externalities. So these three desiderata, range efficiency, strategy proofness, and efficient investments, any two of them implies the last one. So you give me any mechanism with a monotone algorithm, if it has range efficient allocations and it's strategy proof, then it has efficient investments. And if it has range efficient allocations and it has efficient investments, then it's strategy proof. And these two directions, actually, uh, you should just see as uh, corollaries of the green lafont holmstrom theorem. It turns out that uh, strategy proofness and efficient investments are equally good ways to characterize the VCG prices or the pseudo VCG prices when you restrict the set R that you're maximizing over. So these are maybe less, less surprising directions. The last is maybe a little bit more subtle. The last direction says, if you have efficient investments and your strategy proof, then you have range efficient allocations. And the subtlety about that is that efficient investments by itself places no restriction on the allocation algorithm, right? It only says whatever the allocation algorithm is, when you make a change in your value, we need to compensate you exactly however much the algorithm's welfare changes. And strategy proofness doesn't place any restrictions on the algorithm except for monotonicity. Nonetheless, you put these two things together and they imply that your algorithm must exactly, exactly optimize over some set R. And uh, in particular, right, that we view this as a little bit of a negative result, right? This says that if you wanted to get the in investments incentives exactly right, you have to look at this fairly constrained class of algorithms. You ha it has to be that you've got to be able to simplify the problem far enough that it's feasible to exactly optimize, right? And remember, this has to happen, that, that simplification has to happen in advance of you looking at the value profile. Now, of course, in many computationally hard problems, this can lead to poor allocative efficiency, right? One easy way to get range efficiency is to say, choose the constant allocation algorithm, right? Just don't change no matter what the value profile is, but that would do terrible for allocative efficiency. Uh, and in general, right, this says, if you want to get the investment incentives exactly right, this is the small class you have to look at. Um, now, in, in some problems, it's feasible to look at that class and there might be algorithms that do well in that class, but that's not, that's not, al that's not always gonna be true. And so what we want to do having established that exactly efficient investments are in fact a quite demanding um, requirement, we want to think about what it would mean to be nearly efficient and how we would do this with nearly efficient algorithms. So just a quick recap, all monotone allocation rules can be made into strategy proof mechanisms. For these mechanisms, their investment incentives are entirely pinned down by the algorithm itself. These algorithmic externalities, these mispricings where changes in your value aren't reflected, you know, that affect social welfare aren't fully reflected in the prices you face can cause inefficient investments. And the only algorithms that avoid this problem are those that exactly optimize, potentially on a restricted subset of the available allocations. Cool. So this is a natural point to like pause and take questions, um, you know, the, the, the optimal rate of interruption is almost certainly higher than the current rate of interruption. So, Shengu, I have a question. Yes. So, um, are you familiar with the notion that we have uh, of a maximal in range mechanisms? Yes, yes. So, so, can you, so yeah. range efficiency is almost like maximal in range. Range efficiency can only defer. It's slightly weaker, and it's slightly weaker in the case of ties, right? Um, maximal in range. Right, I think would say we're going to pick the uh, the arg max. Right, I'm going to pick. Uh, I'm going to choose the set R, and I'm going to maximum choose the best allocation in that set R. Range efficiency just says the welfare I deliver you has to equal the best allocation in the set R, and so it's slightly weaker. What it says is if there was another allocation outside R that was exactly tied with the best allocation inside R, you could pick the allocation outside R, and that would be fine. It's not a real difference. Like it's not a material difference. It's only, it's, it's slightly more permissive in the case of ties. Uh, and that slight permissiveness is in fact, what gets this triple theorem to work. Uh, if we had maximal in range, uh, that would in fact be um, efficient investments and strategy proofness only imply range efficiency, the slightly weaker condition, they don't imply maximal in range. But like, I think for all practical purposes, these are going to be the same condition. Okay, thanks. 
great, great talk. I really enjoyed this. Um, I had a question actually about whether these ideas would extend to social choice problems. So rather than just assigning one item to one agent, where perhaps multiple agents could benefit from the, from the same item? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I think that there are two thoughts. One is that, remember, we haven't placed any structure on that feasible set A, right? Um, so when I said, you know, there's this set A that is a subset of the power set of allocations, right? Um, I could say, for instance, that, you know, you can only be satisfied if Bob is satisfied. So, you know, that's like a public good shared between you and Bob. Uh, and if you were doing multi-dimensional multi types, uh, as we do in the paper, right? So many of the theorems generalize to multi-dimensional types. You could embed certain kinds of social choice problems by having it be that uh, the feasible allocations are everybody gets, you know, uh, sort of the, the, the first dimension of their type or everybody gets the second dimension of their type and so on, right? So using that richness there, you can embed some amount of, you know, problems of that variety. Thanks, sounds like fun. Cheers. Um, okay, so what I want to do now is to move to the question of what we do if we instead use an approximation algorithm. Uh, so for this audience, this slide is probably redundant, but it, you know there are lots of approximation algorithms that are fast, reasonable to use, but are gonna violate range efficiency. Uh, and so you know, just to create common knowledge for any beta uh, between zero and one, we're going to say an algorithm is a beta approximation if for every instance it delivers welfare that's at least beta times the welfare under the efficient allocation. So, you know, for instance, if I took the smart greedy algorithm, which packs the max of the greedy output and the single bidder with the highest value, uh, the smart greedy algorithm is going to be a half approximation for the knapsack problem. And I mentioned that because that's actually going to be a useful example uh, of an algorithm for some of the conditions that are to come. Uh, so, you know, we, we want to think about these kinds of approximations. Uh, and the thought is, so we're starting with a monotone algorithm and we're running the corresponding strategy proof mechanism. We know that if we had efficient allocations and it was strategy proof, that would lead to efficient investments. Is it true that if we have nearly efficient allocations and it's strategy proof, that leads to nearly efficient investments? Now, to ask that question well, I'm going to need to define what it means to be nearly efficient, including investments. So I'm just gonna, you know, take what I think is a, a, a moderately natural definition. Um, the thought is that some bidder is going to choose between a value V upper bar at some cost C upper bar and a value V lower bar at a cost zero, at a cost we're gonna just normalize to zero. So that's an investment technology. An investment technology is just a pair. It says you can either have this value at this cost or you can have this other value for free. Um, and the thought is that given some investment technology and his threshold price, the bidder is going to choose an investment that maximizes his payoff under the strategy proof mechanism. So this set B star are just his best response investments, right? He's got two investments to choose from and he's gonna pick whichever investment maximizes his utility, which of course includes the investment cost. Now, um, we're gonna measure welfare using investment, this W bar, right? just says, look, given some investment technology for bidder N, given some value profile for the other bidders, given some set of feasible allocations, we're gonna look at the sort of minimum within the set of best responses of the welfare the algorithm delivers minus the investment cost. Now, uh, you know, it's natural to ask, like why the minimum, why not take some other selection from the best response correspondence? It turns out every selection from the best response correspondence yields the same results. Uh, I'm taking the minimum here just to avoid ambiguity. Uh, you know, and, and, and essentially that's going to be true because of the way we're defining approximation, including investment. We're taking a worst case scenario. So what's our, what do we mean by approximately efficient investments? We'll need a benchmark. And our benchmark is pretty demanding. Our benchmark is efficient investments and efficient allocations. So this W bar star, right? That is saying that we're first going to maximize over the investments and we're going to maximize over the available allocations, right? Uh, so we're sort of completely abstracting from any computational issues in this benchmark, right? We're saying you get to, you get to choose whatever is the, you know, the total first best in this situation. Um, 
And we're going to say that an algorithm is a beta approximation with investment if for any investment instance. So an investment instance specifies an investment technology for one bidder, values for the other bidders and feasible allocations. Uh, we have that the welfare that the algorithm delivers is at least beta times the, the first best welfare, including investments. Right, so the subtle thing about this definition is that it allows some amount of inefficient investment, right? It's saying you can have cases where the bidder privately selfishly makes an investment that the social planner does not like. Uh, we're just requiring that the welfare net of investment costs is within beta of the first best for some beta less than one. So is there only one bidder that is deciding on investment or everyone? Yeah, so, so we are thinking one bidder at a time. There is a very natural question of like how these results would change uh, if you have more than one bidder. And that raises a couple of subtleties. One subtlety is that uh, the benchmark itself, VCG is a VCG will start to fail that benchmark, right? Because VCG can have bad equilibria with multiple investors. And so if we're taking a worst case selection of the equilibria of an investment game, even VCG can fail to be uh, a one approximation by this definition. So one would need to first carry out an equilibrium selection. Uh, and then I'm going to show you a condition shortly that gets investment incentives right. But if you have multiple bidders, then we know that you in fact need a slightly stronger condition. Um, so we are focusing on one bidder. Uh, you know, you can take this as kind of gradual long run adjustment where you're taking is given what the other bidders are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would be materially different if we had multiple bidders doing this. And if, if you were focusing on the best equilibrium instead of the worst? So I think even if you're focusing on the, so if you're focusing on the best equilibria, then VCG would be a one approximation by the relevant definition to write down, but you would still need a stronger, you, you would, I'm gonna show you a condition in a few slides. You would need a stronger condition than that in order to get things to work. Um, okay, so, a natural question is what is gonna to happen to allocative guarantees, right? When we add investments, we've started from some allocation algorithm. It's a beta approximation for some beta less than one. Um, we're adding an investment technology. What happens to the guarantee? Uh, and an observation is of course, this guarantee can't get better, right? Uh, and why is that? Well, because the investment problems embed all the allocation problems, right? The uh, I can, have investment instances with the trivial allocation technology, you can have a value of 10 with a price of zero or a value of 10 at a price of zero. And so what that implies is that for any beta, if the algorithm's not a beta approximation, it's not a beta approximation with investment. Now it turns out adding these investment technologies can make things a lot worse. In fact, even discontinuously worse. So, um, you might hope that being very, very close to optimal means that the investment incentives are sort of almost right, but that's not true. So for all beta strictly less than one, uh, there exists a beta approximation for the knapsack problem that is no more than a zero approximation with investment. Um, and so unfortunately, there's just continuity. There, there, there's no continuity in general. Uh, algorithms can be close to optimal and yet you add these investment technologies and their approximation guarantee can be way off. And so that shows you that beta approximate allocations and strategy proofness don't in general imply beta approximation with investments. Now, what does the bad case look like? Um, how do these guarantees get worse? This is how they get worse. So here's a, an algorithm that's a bit of a toy algorithm, but it will make the point cleanly. So think of this satisficing algorithm. The way it works is that it's a bit lazy. If bidder one's value exceeds 99% of the total of the sum of everybody's values, then pack her only. Otherwise, optimize exactly. Now, uh, just sort of by construction, this algorithm is a 0.99 approximation. Because of course, the sum of everybody's values is, is an upper bound for the, to for the, for the efficient allocations welfare. Um, so imagine we had two bidders and both of them fit in the knapsack. Uh, now, how does the algorithm perform on this problem? Well, if bidder one's value is high enough, it's only going to pack bidder one. Uh, and if bidder one's value is not high enough, then it's going to optimize exactly. So it, it will end up packing both of them. Now, notice that because bidder one is always packed, her threshold price is zero. So suppose she has the following investment technology. 
she can either have value zero at cost zero or value k plus epsilon at cost k. Now, you know, for epsilon greater than zero, this is profitable, right? It's profitable to make this investment. But notice that if I took k large enough, then beta one would be a large enough fraction of the total for the algorithm to terminate in the first step. So only bitter one would get packed. The welfare the algorithm would deliver would be k plus epsilon minus the cost of investment k, which is epsilon. What's the first best welfare? Well, the first best is you should pack both bidders and you should make the investment for a welfare of v2 plus epsilon. And that argument establishes that this algorithm's approximation ratio, even though it has an allocative guarantee of 0.99, its approximation ratio with investment has to be below epsilon over v2 plus epsilon. And of course, we can take epsilon as small as we like. That shows you that this is uh, no more than a zero approximation with investment. Now, um, I want to point out something that's like weird about this algorithm that's maybe worth uh, highlighting. This algorithm has what we might think of as a bossy negative externality. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, when bitter one's value is zero, bitter two is packed. So bitter two, you know, has value, you know, gets welfare V2. When we raise bitter one's value from zero to K plus epsilon, that didn't change whether bitter one is packed, but it reduced the welfare of bitter two. So that's a negative externality. It's an unpriced effect on the other bidder's welfare in the algorithm. It's a bossy negative externality. Why? Well, because we're changing bitter one's value in a direction that for a monotone algorithm can't possibly change whether or not she's packed. And so, you know, I would say, by the way, uh, I've, I've used this toy algorithm because it makes the point cleanly. This is not just a problem for a toy algorithm. So there's a, uh, there's a standard fully polynomial time approximation scheme for the knapsack problem. You may remember it. it you know, it's basically like dynamic programming with rounding it turns out that it has the exact same vulnerability. So uh, you can, by choosing your investment instances correctly, screw up the rounding such that even though the FP task, of course, can get arbitrarily close to the optimum, uh, it, it's in general a zero approximation uh, when you uh, add these investment opportunities. So, you know, there are sensible algorithms that fail this, you know, that, that, that fail in this way. Now, a natural question is, look, um, we've got th these maybe pathological cases, right? Where we've got some pretty good guarantee, we add an investment technology, things get a lot worse. And a natural question is like, can we avoid that somehow? Which algorithms are robust in the sense that when we add investment opportunities, they continue to perform just as well as before. And so uh, a, a first thought, a natural thought is to say, what if we just forbid these kinds of bossy negative externalities? And so this is this condition in words. So it says, imagine we start from some instance and we look at the uh, allocation that the algorithm outputs. Suppose we raise the value of a packed bidder or lower the value of an unpacked bidder. Then we should have that the total welfare of the other bidders doesn't fall. Sorry, give me just a moment. Um, now, what that, this is just that condition in math, right? This says the algorithm is axbone. Uh, it excludes bossy negative externalities. If for any allocation instance um, and any V prime and any change in bitter n's value, if either n is packed and we raise his value or n is not packed and we lower his value, then we have that the total welfare of the other bidders does not fall, right? So that's exactly forbidding these kinds of bossy negative externalities. And the theorem says, you know, that essentially this works. That if for any beta, if the algorithm is axbone and a beta approximation, then it's a beta approximation with investment. Now, this is where, you know, getting back to Moshe's question, what, what would happen if we had multiple bidders? Axbone is not sufficient. You would need a stronger condition. You would need, so we know that non-bossiness, which is a strengthening of axbone is sufficient with multiple bidders, but we don't, quite know if you need to go all the way there or if some something in between would also work. Now, let me give you some examples of these to build a bit of intuition. Uh, notice that any 
exactly optimal algorithm is axmal. In fact, any maximal and range algorithm is axmal, right? Because when I raise the value of a packed bidder, you've got to get at least as much welfare for the other bidders or you can't be maximal in range. Uh, the greedy algorithm is axmal. Why is that? Well, remember that sorting phase of greedy, right? Now, if I take a bidder who is packed and I move him earlier, the sorting phase terminates at the same point. And so the welfare of the other bidders has to be the same. If I move a bit, take a bidder who is not packed and I move him later, the sorting phase can't terminate any faster than it did before. So the welfare of the other bidders has to be at least as much. Um, it turns out that these, this property has this neat, neat thing that it's preserved under maximization. So the max of any set of axbone algorithms is itself an axbone algorithm. And so to use that observation, smart greedy is an axbone algorithm, right? Smart greedy is the max of the algorithm that, you know, the greedy algorithm, the algorithm that packs bit of one for sure, the algorithm that packs bit of two for sure, and so on and so on and so on, right? So smart greedy is a half approximation and it's axbone. And so the theorem is saying that no matter what investment technology we add, the welfare, including investment in a mechanism based on the smart greedy algorithm is at least half of the first best welfare with investment. Any non-bossy monotone algorithm is axbone. And by non-bossy, I just mean, if I change your value without changing whether or not you're packed, the allocation algorithm, the, the allocation chosen has to be the same. And so for instance, greedy rejection algorithms of the kind that were used for the 2017 FCC reverse auction are uh, non-bossy, so they're axbone. Uh, by the way, uh, if you have a monotone axbone algorithm, that implies that it's bitonic in the sense of Mu'alem and Nissan. Um, it's in fact slightly stronger than bitonic. Um, but, you know, so, so for those of you who, are, who, who, who understand this definition, it's, it's, it's a, you know, bitonic essentially says that if I, you know, in our language, it, it, it says, if I uh, raise the value of a packed bidder, I don't lose more than that value in terms of how much from the other bidders. And if I lower the value of a, an unpacked bidder, the value of the, uh, the welfare of the other bidders doesn't fall. Ours is a stronger condition. Ours says, even when you raise the welfare of a packed bidder, uh, the value of the other, the welfare of the other bidders doesn't fall. Not that you can sort of trade an equal amount away from these bidders. Um, so let me give you um, a sense of the proof. Uh, in fact, like it turns out the proof for this is pretty dead easy. It fits on one slide. So the thought is we take an investment instance such that the investor is not indifferent. And in this notation, these welfare W of X, I'm gonna suppress the dependence of these on V minus N, the other bidder's values, and A, the feasible allocations, because those arguments aren't gonna move around. Now there's an easy case to deal with. What is this case? If V upper bar minus C upper bar is less than V lower bar, that's saying if the if the investment doesn't even cover its own cost, if the rise in value doesn't even cover the cost, then the investor, because he faces a threshold price, chooses not to invest. But of course, that's also first best because the investment doesn't even cover the cost. So that's easy, we're done. Uh, the non-trivial case is when the investment at least covers its cost. So V upper bar minus C upper bar is at least V lower bar. Now, what is this line saying? It's uh, saying, observe that the welfare, W bar star, that's the welfare, the first best welfare at this investment instance. That's equal to the allocated welfare at the instance where we replaced bidder N's value with his net value, his value net of the investment cost. And why is that so? Well, if you were exactly optimizing and you were packing this bidder, the investment covers its costs. So you might as well make the investment. How much value do you get from this guy? Well, you get V upper bar minus the cost C upper bar. If you're not packing this bidder, then you shouldn't have him make the investment. So how much value are you getting from him? Zero. So the welfare at this investment instance is exactly equal to the welfare at the allocation instance where we just put in his net value, his value net of investment costs. 
Now, there are just two cases to deal with. The first case is imagine what the algorithm would do if we replace bitter, one's, bitter n's value with his value net of investment costs. Well, one thing it could do is it could pack him, right? So if n is packed at his net value, that means that his net value exceeds his threshold price. That means that the investment is weakly profitable. And since the investor is not indifferent, that means the investor makes the investment. He chooses V upper bar and C upper bar. Now, what is this next line saying? It's saying, okay, beta times the first best investment welfare is beta times the welfare, allocate of welfare at the net value. But the algorithm is a beta approximation. And since it's a beta approximation, that's at least welfare that the algorithm delivers at the net value. What's this next line saying? This next line, this, this next bit is saying, okay, I'm taking this bidder who has a uh, value V upper bar minus C upper bar. And I'm, he's packed at that value and I'm raising his value to V upper bar. So I'm raising his value. Since I'm raising the value of a packed bidder, X is monotone, so we have to still pack him. X is X bone, so we have to get at least as much welfare from everybody else. And that means that total welfare has to rise by at least a change, which is C upper bar. But this thing that we've got, this welfare that the algorithm delivers at V upper bar minus the cost of investment C upper bar, that's exactly the welfare at the investment instance under the algorithm. So we're done. We're show, we, we've shown that this is, you know, that we're within beta of the first best in the investment problem in this case. The next case is very similar. Uh, suppose that bidder N is not packed when we report his net value to the algorithm. Well, that means that his net value is below the threshold price. It's not worth making the investment. So the investor chooses not to invest. And every step is exactly as before. The only step that's different is this one over here. What am I doing here? I'm taking the welfare the algorithm achieves at this net value, V upper bar minus C upper bar. Now the bidder is not packed at this net value and I'm lowering his value to V lower bar. But of course I'm lowering the value of a packed bidder of an, sorry, I'm lowering the value of an unpacked bidder. And Axbone says the welfare of the other bidders can't fall. So the total welfare can't fall. So we at least do at least as well as before. And that's exactly the welfare that the algorithm gets in this investment instance. So you can kind of see how this works, right? What, this, what we've just shown is that at least when the investor is not indifferent, the welfare the algorithm delivers when it's exponent and a beta approximation is at least beta of the first best welfare, including investment. And a rough intuition for what this proof is doing is it's showing, right, that in some sense, only these bossy negative externalities are the ones that are bad for performance when we add investment. Like there can be other externalities. There can be cases where private profitable investments are not socially optimal and socially optimal investments are not privately profitable. There can be other kinds of externalities, like for instance, mispricing at the threshold price, but those don't matter for those, to the extent that those externalities are there, they are already reflected in the allocative guarantee. The additional things we need to worry about are these bossy negative externalities and forbidding them is enough to get things to work out. Now it's exceedingly natural to ask like, to what extent is this a necessary condition? And let me give you a precise sense in which it can be weakened slightly. So notice of course, that we can take sub problems, right? An allocation problem omega prime is a sub problem omega if its instances are a subset of the original problem. And notice that because we are taking worse cases, the approximation ratios can only improve on a sub problem. So for instance, the subproblem of knapsack where no bidder's size exceeds 10% of the knapsack's capacity, for that subproblem, greedy is a 0.9 approximation, not a zero approximation. Of course, exponent is inherited by subproblems. So if the algorithm is exponent on a problem, then for any subproblem omega prime and any beta prime, if X is a beta prime approximation on omega prime, then it's a beta prime approximation with investment on omega prime. So this is saying, if you put more structure on the problem, if you're willing to look at a subset of the instances, the algorithm's approximation ratio might improve. And because exponent is inherited, its investment guarantee is also going to improve step-by-step step for every subproblem. And so it's natural to ask 
how far can we weaken this X-bone condition and still have this implication go through, right? Still have these guarantees be robust to investment on every subproblem. So this theorem is giving that kind of thing. It's saying, give me an algorithm that's a beta approximation on omega, some problem, for some non-trivial beta, some beta strictly more than zero. These two statements are equivalent, that X is weakly X bone on the problem, and that for any subproblem omega prime and any guarantee beta prime, beta prime could be strictly more than the original problem would give us. If X is a beta prime approximation on omega prime, it's still a beta prime approximation when we add investment on omega prime. So this is saying there's some condition and I'm gonna give you this condition in a moment, right? Where that's sort of necessary and sufficient for the implication to pass through. And in particular, that means that if you fail this condition, then we can locate a subproblem for which the algorithm's performance with investment is strictly worse than its performance just with allocation. Now, what does that condition look like? This is the condition. The only difference is in red. So what this is saying is that X bone can be weakened, but it can only be weakened in the downward direction and only in this way. Remember X bone said, if I lower the value of an unpacked bidder, then the welfare of the other bidders doesn't fall. Weak X bone is saying, if I lower the value of an unpacked bidder, for whom it is strictly optimal to pack that bidder, that's to say that bidder is in every efficient allocation at that instance, then the welfare of the other bidders doesn't fall. Now there's something uh, weird about this theorem. And the weird thing is that in the problems we're interested in, we can't compute efficient allocations. So for a given violation of X bone, knowing whether or not the algorithm still satisfies weak X bone requires some, some cleverness right, to figure out, because you're gonna need, gonna need to at least say that we know that it was not strictly optimal to pack this bidder. And that's why this particular violation in the, in the downward direction is still okay. Um, so I guess what this is saying is, look, for, for X bone, um, we view that as like the practical thing. If you wanted something that says your guarantee is robust to these simple investment opportunities, that's the thing that will get the implication to pass through. Weak X bone is sort of conceptually useful because it's telling us how much slack there is in the definition, but for practical purposes, it's not gonna be as easy to check. There are a bunch of extensions. Uh, many of them, I imagine you could guess at how you do them. Uh, you know, you can extend every result to cost minimization. You're just flipping a bunch of signs. You know, you can do traveling salesman, Steiner tree. Um, some of the standard Steiner tree algorithms violate X bone in subtle ways. Um, you can extend these results to multidimensional types. Um, we do it for convex type spaces. Uh, so we can just use WMON as a condition. Uh, and many of the results still pass through nicely with multidimensional types. Um, you can extend these results to combinatorial auctions with fractionally subadditive preferences, uh, but you need to make a restriction on the investment costs. It turns out that you need the inv investing in uh, an investment that's good for object A and an investment that's good for object B uh, need to be substitutes um, because otherwise you can sneak complementarities into uh, the problem using the investment technology. But assuming that you rule those out, uh, you can show that sort of good approximation algorithms for fractionally subadditive preferences are going to remain so um, in a combinatorial auction. Cool. So, so very high level, uh, these are the things that I wanted to say, uh, you know, strategy proof, in a strategy proof mechanism, there is in fact a, a, a very intimate relationship between efficient investments and exact optimization. These two things kind of go hand in hand. Um, algorithms can be really near to optimal and yet be very far from optimal when you add just these simple investment technologies, just for one bidder, even under complete information. And what's the problem? Well, there are these bossy negative externalities. Um, if you have an algorithm where you can rule these out, then in fact, your guarantee is robust. Any allocative guarantee you give remains optimal when we add these simple investment technologies. Uh, and this weak X bone is a necessary and sufficient condition, uh, but it's not as easy to check. Cool. Great, um, thanks very much. That, that, that's a wrap. Uh, happy to chill yeah. out, take questions. <laughs>